segment two, the second sub-book in War, Killing. Um, like the rest of the book, you're mostly concerning yourself here with narrative, with description, with reporting on what you see, but you offer a couple of different ways of understanding the essential activity of combat, killing. Here's one, quote, war is a lot of things, and it's useless to pretend that exciting isn't one of them. It's insanely exciting. War is supposed to feel bad because undeniably bad things happen in it, but for a 19-year-old at the working end of a 50 cal during a firefight, war is life multiplied by some number that no one has ever heard of. Close quote. So forget rationalizations about why war may be just in certain circumstances. Young men kill other men because it makes them feel so alive. Is that part of what's going uh, on? No, I, suppose you, I think you're reversing the cause and effect a little bit. They're put in these situations for political reasons. Uh, I mean, they join up maybe because of 9-11 or their father was in the military. Um, war is triggered by political problems. The guy, one way or another, the guys find themselves out there. And what happens to them um, is that the, the rationale for the war itself disappears in combat. And what remains is the bond between the men. Um, and that bond is intoxicating. Um, to be in a small unit where your job is very clear and you're functioning the way you were trained to do, protecting your brothers in that platoon and they're protecting you, is a situation you cannot recreate in society. Um, it's a very fulfilling one. And it's confusing to these guys because they come back, they come home, and they miss something that is absolutely terrible. It's like missing a really, really bad marriage. Um, and it confuses them, and they don't know what to do with the contradiction. Mm -hmm. uh, here's one sentence I'm going to quote. The guy who blows us up is 100 feet away behind a rock. Describe that incident. Um, it was in the winter. Uh, the weather was really bad, and I couldn't get on a resupply helicopter. There were no flights, so I was on a, a supply convoy to get into the Korangal Valley. I was in the second Humvee, and uh, we were blown up by a roadside bomb detonated by a guy 100 feet away behind a rock, uh, hardwired to the explosive. And um, it went off under the engine block instead of under us, and that spared us injury or, or worse. Um, and I, I just, you know, later afterwards, you know, we survived it. There was combat after that. The Humvee caught fire. We got out of it okay. And, we, and the soldiers found the wire that he had used to, to blow us up. And then they found the campfire that had kept him warm all night while, while he was waiting for the convoy to come into the valley. It was very cold. Um, and then they found the battery he used to trigger the, uh, to trigger the charge. Um, there were all these kind of, we could see his footprints. There were all these kind of human evidence of like a human being, just 100 feet away, who had tried to kill or maim all of us. And I was just struck by um, the, I don't know, the kind of humanity of, of the situation and the incredible brutality of it. Like, these are, I didn't know him, he didn't know us. And he was trying to do the worst thing possible to us. And, and that, and we were trying to do the same thing to him, the soldiers were. And right. that is one of the tragedies and ironies of war. You write, killing begins to make a kind of sense to me. A man behind a rock touched two wires to a battery and tried to kill me to kill us. There are other ways to understand what he did, but none of them underrides the raw fact that this man wanted to negate everything I'd ever done in my life or, ever, or might ever do, close quote. What's so striking there to me in that passage is that killing begins to make a kind of sense, You're an emotional sense. You understand why, why the soldiers feel they have no choice but to shoot, to, to kill when they can, when they're forced to. What, what, what do you mean when you say it me begins to make sense to you there? People see killing as a moral choice. And in a situation where your life is in danger, it ceases being a moral choice and becomes a very practical one. Got it. Final passage from, uh, from the second sub-book or book of war. Once in a while, you'd forget to think of the enemy as the enemy and would see them for what they were, teenagers up on a hill who got tired and cold just like the Americans. Once you thought about them in those terms, it was hard not to wonder whether the men themselves, not the commanders, but the actual guys behind the guns couldn't somehow sit down together and work this out. Close quote. And what's striking in that passage to me is once in a while. Why, is it, why isn't this thought haunting the entire experience? You needed a certain amount of um, 
quiet time to get in touch with who the enemy was. When they were shooting at you, it didn't really matter who they were. Someone was trying to kill you. I had bullets hit, you know, inches from my head. I got blown up. Everyone in the platoon was almost killed. Um, and you really needed a week or two without a firefight to start to think, well, there's guys on the next hilltop over who are sort of watching the clouds drift by all day, wondering when we're going to attack them, and we're wondering the same thing. And in the end, it's just guys like us over there. And, 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 but it took a certain amount of peace and quiet to come to that thought. Okay. And, and it didn't go very far from there. <laughs>